conference. Uh, the first speaker is Russ Kaflisch from UCLA, who will speak on searching for singularities in vortical flow. Russ. Thank you. It's a, it's a real um, privilege to be here. I'm, I'm really grateful to the organizers, um, um, uh, Milton and Helena and, um, and um, uh, Leonid and also um, 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 the, uh, the others. Uh, and I have several reasons that I'm pleased to be here. One of them is it's my first time to IMPA and Rio, and uh, I, I'm the director of a math institute with the same name. So I'm pleased with that, about that. And also, I haven't worked very much in vertical flow for um, maybe a decade, and I'm happy to be back and see the state of things. Now, some things have changed, and one thing that changed is the um, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, well, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there would be, have been a lot of interest in this topic of, of singularity formation. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that was a, so what I'm going to talk about is singularities in incompressible inviscid flow for the, the Euler equations. And that was a topic that was really, there was a, lot, a, a tremendous amount of effort in it uh, without resolving the, the, the problem. Now, it's related to the, the problem of singularities for Navier-Stokes. Um, I would say that there's, there's more fluid uh, mechanics interest in the Euler problem and maybe more PDE interest in the, um, in the Navier-Stokes problem. Um, but what I want to show you is, well, I'm going to describe a couple things. Uh, first of all, I, there's, I, I'm going to give um, a, a survey of what's been done in the field, but I'll emphasize the work that I've done with uh, a collaborator, Mike Siegel, uh, where we've looked at complex sing singularities in the complex plane. But then I'm going to, I'm going to spend most of the time actually talking about uh, work by Tom Howe and Guo Lo at Caltech, where they have numerically constructed a, um, well, I think, I think they're being modest in what they say here. They have, a, they have a, a, um, a really excellent candidate for a singular solution. I'm not used to giving a talk on work that's not mine. I, you know, I, I think this is the first time I think I've really made most of a talk about something that wasn't my own work. So we'll see how it goes. I won't be able to answer all the questions. Um, but I, I have talked with them extensively about their work, and they've even given me permission to use their slides. So um, uh, th I think this is a terrific piece of work that's going to lead to lots of, uh, of further things. Uh, so here's what I'll talk about. I'll say a little bit about the, 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 the significance of singularities in fluid dynamics, and then uh, various attempts to construct numerical singularities. Our, my, my own work has been on, like I said, has been on complex singularities, and we've looked at uh, numerical constructions there, but I'll spend uh, at least half the talk on this construction by Lowe and Howe, their, their computations. All right, so, um, well, this is hardly necessary in this audience, but we've got the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, uh, or in vorticity form, um, here it is, and here's the energy dissipation, that the, the uh, time derivative of the kinetic energy is this quantity with inverse Reynolds number, and uh, the uh, integral grad u squared. Now, in spite of that, there's, there's a long time uh, uh, observation that in a turbulent flow, in fully developed turbulence, the energy dissipation is independent of the Reynolds number. And that's, that's a basic uh, uh, experimental and also computational fact. Um, it's not a mathematical fact. And um, uh, however, um, in the same um, spirit of the, the, this, the uh, comment yesterday about on, by, by Vinokov about Onsager's work, Onsager in 1949, in the same paper that um, he talked about uh, point vortices, he also described inviscid singularities as a source of turbulent energy dissipation. Now, there's a little bit of sleight of hand here because um, what Onsager was really talking about was fully developed turbulence, and what I'm going to be talking about is the onset is something transient. I'm going to talk about the onset of singularities, so it would be the onset of, tur of turbulence. Uh, however, I believe the two are related. Uh, whoops. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Onsager um, found a criteria that, that, uh, that, uh, the, um, that if you have a, a singularity of order alpha, you could have uh, the energy, that you would need alpha less than one third uh, in order for, uh, for there to be um, inviscid energy dissipation. And you could, and, and there was, that was made mathematical by Constantine E. and Titi, um, 
and, uh, and there were some improvements on that. One of the improvements I was involved in was to uh, assume that this, the singularities were not, not dense, but were on, restricted to a set of co-dimension kappa, and then you get this additional requirement that al alpha half has to be even more negative. More negative means more singular, um, uh, uh, as the three alpha plus kappa should be less than one. Uh, let me show you a little bit about where that comes from. Here's just kind of a, let's see, this is, this is more or less a dimensional argument, uh, but I make it look a little more mathematical. Um, uh, so I, I imagine I have a set S that's the singular set. It has a co-dimension kappa. If you look at, and so uh, uh, I'll suppose that, uh, that the velocity goes like R to the alpha, where R is the distance from the singular set. And then um, the co-dimension being kappa means that dx can be written as uh, dr times dxs along, the, along this at times a factor r to the kappa minus 1. Um, and we'll assume that u looks like r to the alpha. And now stick in the, um, the, the Euler equations. And we're going to look for energy dissipation from the Euler equations. So if you take the time derivative of the kinetic energy, you get two terms, one from the pressure, one from the convective term. The, um, the pressure one drops out um, because, of in, because of incompressibility. This term goes away right away. Uh, this term, though, is more nonlinear, and the, the, um, it's not just incompressibility, it's also an integration by parts. And so this is the term that could produce, if you go through the analysis, this is the term that could, could produce, could dissipate energy. So, um, oops, right, I threw that term away. And then I put in, I put in that u is r to the alpha, so there's three u, so that's three alpha. There's a derivative, so that's, alpha, that's minus one. And then dx is r to the kappa minus one dr, and also this dx along the, the surface s. And so the, um, the convective integral, in order for it to, if it's, if it's finite, then it will be, it'll be zero. I mean, we need a singularity in that in order for it to be non-zero. And so um, the condition that, uh, that this not be absolutely integrable is that uh, 3 alpha plus kappa is less than 1. That's the singularity condition. Um, right. So um, that, um, that, led to, that led to a um, Onsager's remark and, and this improvement on it you know, led, to, um, led to a search for singularities for Euler as, a, as a, uh, an explanation for turbulent energy dissipation. Uh, I'm going to start with the mathematical part, although really the computations were done first. So there are some, there are some uh, mathematical results on them. Well, these are necessary conditions for singularity. Uh, the first one was by Bill Katomaita in, in 84. It said that, the time in, that if there's a singularity, then a necessary condition is that the, um, the, the um, L1 norm, the time integral of the L1 norm of the vorticity was, inf was infinite. Um, actually, this was preceded by a result by uh, Bardos and Beneshur, where they just said that the, the L1 norm of the gradient of U would be infinite. It's the, it's, it's the integral in time of the L infinity norm. I'm sorry, did I say L1? I'm sorry, I meant to say L infinity. Um, and um, this, was a, um, this was improved somewhat. Well, I would say improved because it's a more detailed criteria, uh, more geometric criteria, by uh, Constantine Pfefferman and Maida some, a, a decade later. And it's, it's more complicated than this, but roughly they showed that for, if there's a singularity, then either the velocity blows up or the gradient of the direction of vorticity blows up. Um, that was a... That was, a, um, that, that was a new ingredient in any of this, was looking at gradients of a direction of a vector. Uh, there were some refinements of the, um, of, uh, the Biocotomida result by Che, and there was also a refinement of the, of the um, CFM result by Deng Hao and Yu, and their refinement was to make it more of a local criteria. Theirs is a little more complicated. It involves integrals on a little piece of, uh, on a little, uh, uh, piece of a vortex line through the singularity. Uh, there's a, and there's a somewhat easier to apply because it's more local. So these were, these were, numerical, these were the analytic results. As far as I know, these are the, really the only um, 
uh, and maybe some generalizations of them, are the only analytic results that tell you uh, conditions for, the, for there to be a singularity or not to be a singularity. Um, now, th this was, that was preceded by work by, um, by Frisch and by Frisch and Orzag on, um, on, on lo actually numerically trying to construct singular solutions of the Euler equations. And they were motivated directly by the, that paper of Onsager, which, um, um, well, it took a while. Uh, it took, it took um, 25 years before, uh, before this was done. But um, um, uh, Frisch and, and collaborators proposed an a, um, energy catastrophe scenario for the development of turbulence that involved a finite time singularity. And then uh, with, with Orzag and also collaborators, they looked at the Taylor Green cell, which is a flow in a cube with, um, with, per with periodic boundary conditions. It's, it's roughly a, a vortex tube that, uh, where the rotation along the tube is, is changing uh, as you, uh, uh, over, the, over the length of the cell and then uh, and, and extended periodically. Uh, uh, this was constructed, this was originally constructed by, uh, as just an example of a fluid flow, because you can, you can more or less write down the solution. So they, um, in a Taylor Green cell with that symmetry, uh, they, they looked for a, sol a singular solution, and they did it by a, a Pate summation of a Taylor series in time, which is, um, as a PD, as a numerical, from a numerical PD viewpoint, and 40 years later, we would see that as a rather crude approach. Uh, but they, they, they did a power series in time, and what they could do was um, um, they could write out an analytic formula for the solution, and, and, but, then they had, but they had to compute some coefficients uh, numerically. And they, could, they took it out to some high order, and, uh, and a potty of expansion it gives you a, an approximation for a full, Taylor ser a full, a full power series from sm a small number of coefficients, a relatively small number, and from that they looked, they found a singularity in time. However, when they did a, 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 a larger computation a few years later with more, uh, more uh, larger Taylor series in time, they found no singularity. And further work on it hasn't, has shown that there's not a singularity in this uh, example, at least within, you know, for a certain set of initial data. Um, there were, there, were, there were a few other works and, and that were like this that were, had a different scenario in mind. And the one that, had, that stood the longest was by Robert Kerr, who's now at Warwick. And it involved two vortex tubes coming toward each other. The vortex tubes are, uh, because of the, 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 rot the counter, they're counter-rotating vortex tubes, they will move together. And, um, and if they're curved, they will also come toward each other. And so what you can, what you can look for is that, that they would come together and, and, in a sense, merge, you know, kind of a vort like, almost like a vortex reconnection. Um, and you, and there's several things that go against that. They start flattening out as well. So Kerr did a set of calculations, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago and predicted a singularity uh, by extrapolation of this at a certain time. Uh, these also were, um, I'm not sure Kerr would agree, but I think these were pretty well shot down by um, further computations, um, uh, almost 15 later, by Tom Howe and, and a, a post, uh, well, a student, um, and here's their comp here's the computations of Howe and Lee that showed the vorticity being bounded. It goes up by a factor of of 20 something uh, in the time that uh, Kerr was computing it. So that computation also didn't. That was promising, and it rep this, this was representative of, of a few other calculations by uh, Sidja and a few others that were doing things like this. Uh, here's, here's, another set of, here's another computation by uh, Richard Peltz. Uh, he, did, he used uh, uh, what's called a, a, a Keita symmetric flow. It has, um, it has th these symmetries to it. Um, there's a 64-fold symmetry in, in space and a three-fold symmetry in components, which is terrific. You know, it's, it's a really, it's a, I guess if you just sit there doing it, you could do it. But to, to actually write it out, it was a really nice thing. And you, so you save, I can't, as I'm giving a talk, I can't multiply 64 times 3. But you save that much in computation time. So um, Peltz 
took advantage of this. Here's a picture of his vortex. He had vortex tubes that were going, you know, that were uh, uh, going together. It's like a, it's like Kerr's calculation on steroids, because it's whatever, uh, I guess, 64 vortex tubes being squeezed down, and um, and then he did a, he did a, uh, he did he actually did viscous computations for this, but um, a, as well as some inviscid computations, and uh, and he seemed to see a singularity. Um, this calculation, I don't have the results here, but this calculation was also repeated by Howe and seemed to not become singular. Uh, you know, some years later with much more computational um, uh, capabilities. Um, right, so um, I, I'm gonna talk, I, I, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own work and the approach that we've taken. I think it's partly, um, of course I'll talk about it partly because I, 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 if I'm giving a talk, I should talk about something I've done. But also, I think it might be relevant to the um, to further analysis of Howell's work. So, uh, what I'm going to describe, in, in, done by Tom Howell and, and Guo Lo, gives a lot of information. Uh, it's not clear how to make it analytic, but it gives a lot of information that an uh, an analyst could um, or a PD person could try to use to really construct something that's that's provably singular. Uh, so, um, the the work I did was on what we tried to do was to construct singularities in complex space and find them to come into to a physical space. And a, a, a simple, and I'm going to give two simple examples that motivate it. The first one is the Cauchy, whoops, it's easy to push the wrong button. The first one is the cauchy riemann equations. Um, if, you, um, if, you, um, if you only took the first half of a PDE course, and learned about the wave equation, but not elliptic equations, then you would say, hey, I know how to solve this equation. This is just the wave equation in imaginary time. And so you could write down the solution, the um, D'Alembert solution, you know, if, 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 unless you took the elliptic part, because then they'd tell you not to do this. But you can you write down the D'Alembert solution of this wave equation in imaginary time, and here it is. And what it shows is that stuff moves in from the upper half plane and from the lower half plane toward the real axis. And so if you have a singularity off in the complex plane, you know, you got perfectly smooth initial data, and there's a singularity off in the complex plane, then it can come in. And, um, well, I guess that, that's one reason they don't want you to do this in elliptic equations is because it develops singularities. Um, and that's not what you're interested in usually. But if you're interested in, oops, if you're interested in singular, sorry. If you're interested in singularities, this, is, this gives you a very simple way of generating them. Um, uh, let's see, I guess I should have said, of course, one, another reason, one reason I'm getting singularities is because if I think of this as a D'Alembert solution, then I'm posing, um, um, I'm posing uh, Cauchy initial data. I'm, I'm putting too much initial data uh, for the elliptic problem. Uh, here's a second example, which is Berger's equation. Inviscid Berger's equation, ut plus uux equals zero with some initial data. You write it in terms of characteristics, dt equals zero on dx equals u, and you can then invert the, the initial data to, as u naught of, of x naught equals u. So that gives you an implicit solution that x is x naught of u plus tu, since u is constant on the characteristics. And you get singularities, ux is infinite if x u is zero. So that is, you can differentiate this and get that the singularity condition is the u derivative of x naught at u plus t is zero. This is what uh, uh, what you talked about yesterday, Vinokov, right? It's it's the same it's the same example, and um, um, and I hope I didn't say that too fast. But this is formation of shocks, and here's a picture of it, um, and it's you start off with uh, initial data say that's blue. If it had this is the right slope for a shock to form because the, the, um, the left curve goes faster, it is proportion, this velocity is proportional to height, so the, the, this part goes to the right, this part goes to the left. At a critical time, you get this red curve that has a, uh, an infinite slope, if I did it right, and then it, 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 then it becomes multi-valued. And what you find from that is that um, uh, uh, u goes like, um, u goes like x to the one-third, t is like u squared, so t is like x to the two-thirds, which is just what you said yesterday. 
I, I, didn't have that, I didn't manage to make that connection until, you know, to change the slide, but I wanted to, to point out that that's the same thing that Wienerkopf said yesterday. So here you can think of um, singularities as um, moving along the characteristics and uh, coming from the complex plane, that is, they would be the, um, they would be the, um, off, bef uh, before there's a real solution of this problem, there is a, um, there will be, there will be complex solutions. Um, complex singularities have been used in a lot of different fluid flows, going back to Garabedian's design of a shock-free airfoil, and then a, lo a lot of other problems. Uh, uh, what I tried to, what I did with this was, I, I applied this to axis symmetric flow with swirl first. It was also done by Frisch uh, and co-workers in 2D Euler. Uh, and then we also tried it on, on something like Peltz's data. To do this, we do a numerical construction of the solution and we look for singularities in the complex plane by fitting the, uh, the Fourier coefficients. So uh, if you have a, a Fourier coefficient, that uh, we, would we would compute these Fourier coefficients numerically, and then we would fit them to uh, something of this form, a constant, k to the minus alpha, and an exponential. This, this exponential tells you how, where the, where the uh, singularity is located. The singularity will look like that, so z star there is the location. If z star has an imaginary part, then, the, um, then it would be off the real axis. The singularity type is is uh, determined by alpha, as it shows, as shown here, and then C1 is just a coefficient that's related to C. It involves alpha and, and K also, uh, sorry, alpha and, right. And um, so we have these three parameters, C, alpha, and K, uh, excuse me, and Z star, and we we do a three-point fit to get this, uh, and, um, uh, and that works quite well, and uh, we've extended this to 3D as well recently. Let's see, let me show you. Um, we did a few other things, and I think in the interest of time, I won't say much more about the, I won't say much details about what we did. We did, um, but we, what, we used a couple tricks, and one of them was to look for an upper analytic solution uh, so that we, um, that gave us one-way coupling between the Fourier coefficients. Uh, this trick has been used a lot of places. It's also called the standard map, I think, in, dynamical, in some dynamical systems. In any case, um, we did find we did find some singularities. They aren't they aren't strong enough to produce real singularities. So um, uh, we did it in axis symmetric flow, like this. We had a we I actually I did it in a, we did it in an annulus, and uh, because we didn't want to worry about r equals zero, and and if I was more clever, I would have done the thing that Tom Tao did, which was a, a transformation that gets rid of that singularity. Um, and, uh, and we got something that looks like this. Uh, here it is at a time before singularities, and here this is showing the angular velocity and the angular vorticity, and here it is at, at our singularity time. Right. Uh, I should show you the fit to the, um, I should, here's a, here is a fit to some of the coefficients as a function of k we have a, a good we have a good fit to our uh, the the coefficients, the parameters in the singularity fit. Yes. Uh, yes. Of course, well, of course, there is energy conservation. However, it's it's complex, right? So the energy that's preserved is complex is a complex function. It, you know, it's integral of u squared. So it doesn't necessarily conserve real energy, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's it's conservative, right? It does. Yeah. Okay, and again, we uh, what we have is not is not strong enough to 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 uh, make a real singularity. Uh, the sing there, so there are, sing well, we don't have a theorem, but we have uh, uh, very good numerical calculations that show singularities in the complex plane. Um, it worked actually better when we did it on something like Peltz's initial data. 
right. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so now uh, this, is the, um, this is the main thing that I wanted to talk about. And um, I think that this is, their title is a, uh, they call it potentially singular flows. I think they didn't think they could get it past referees if they, if they said, we did it. You know, I think they, <laughs> but I think they have done it. Uh, I think that, there's, that this is really strong evidence for a singularity, and um, it's up to PDE people now to, to, um, to, to go from here. So, um, first of all, they, they got rid of, that, of the annulus. They, they do an they do um, axisymmetric flow with swirl. Uh, so they have flow in a, see, do, should I say more about that? I figure that's what, so everybody knows what, what I mean when I say axisymmetric flow with swirl. Axisymmetric flow with swirl is a, is a flow in a, in a well, here it's in a, it's in a cylinder, a circular cylinder. There's, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's axisymmetric in that there's no theta dependence. However, there is a theta vorticity. There is, there is a swirl, so there's flow in the theta direction. Um, if you just said axisymmetric flow, you usually mean that the velocity vector is in the RZ direction, so no, no swirl. So here we have swirl. And, uh, and we have R and Z vorticity in, in addition to theta vorticity. Uh, in axisymmetric flow, it's, it's like planar flow in that the vorticity sticks out of the plane. In axisymmetric flow, you would have only one component of vorticity also. But in axisymmetric flow with swirl, we have all three components of velocity and all three components of vorticity. So here, it's, it's at a cylinder. It's periodic in the Z direction. And, um, right. and then you have these equations. The Euler equations, because of, of the geometric singularity at R, the Euler equations have a singularity in them, because when you take R derivatives, you get some 1 over R terms. But there's a clever transformation using uh, the, uh, the angular velocity divided by R, the angular vorticity divided by R, and the, the, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the stream function divided by R. And that gets you a, a set of equations just for those three quantities with no singularities left in it, no 1 over r's in it. Um, I didn't know this transformation before I learned it from them. I, th I think that's really clever. Uh, so that's one thing they, that, that they started with. There is a 1 over r in, in the, well, yeah, but that's, that's um, right, but not in the convective terms, right? That's just the elliptic equation, though. So that, that, we, that we kind of understand well. Yeah, thank you, though. That's, that's right. There is that. Uh, then, they, then you solve, in the, like I said, in a, in a cylinder, zero, uh, the radius is, is 1, and, and there's a period of L. Uh, they've also, um, there's also no flow conditions. There's a no uh, flow boundary condition at the wall of the cylinder. Uh, no, um, there, there's, there's tangential flow, but no, no normal flow. And, um, and then they've chosen initial data like this, and I realized this morning that, it, that I, I didn't have, that I just have written it, so I'm going to write out the, um, I'm going to write out the precise data they used. It is, um, it's U1, which is the, the uh, this is U theta over R, and it is 100 e to the minus 30, 1 minus R squared to the fourth, sine of 2 pi over L times Z. Um, I don't exactly know why this is why this choice, but um, ah, anyway, it's not a it's not a um, it's not a very uh, complicated choice of initial data, and uh, they they worked on this problem. Tom's been working on this problem for probably two decades, and Lo has been working on it for about five years maybe three years. Anyway, they worked on it a long time. So, um, right. The, um, they've, they've, they've inserted some symmetry, so the flow is even and odd at, uh, in certain places. And what we're going to find is the uh, flow is going to look like this. And it's in this cylinder. Uh, you could, the, you could, because of the symmetries, you could take the, you could take the, um, you can take the bottom and top of the cylinder to be walls, and the, the, the singularity occurs right here. Well, of course, it occurs, of course, it's axisymmetric, so it occurs in this ring right here. And that is, and, and the important thing is, 
it, it actually occurs at a corner, not just at a wall, it occurs at a corner. It's the corner of two walls. The bottom um, is a wall because of symmetry considerations. This is an actual wall. It's periodic in Z, but there's no wall, but, because, but it's also symmetric. So there's no flow through that. So you could, there's, no, there's no Z velocity at the top and bottom of the cylinder. The, 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 uh, the velocity is not zero, there's swirling flow, and there's radial flow, but no z-flow. Yeah, the normal component of the velocity is zero. Right. Thank you, yes. Okay. Um, right, so they, they said it there, they can do it on, on a quarter of the length because of the symmetries and the boundaries are like, imperme are like walls. Uh, now, the, um, now, I'm more of a PDE person than a numerical person, uh, but they, so um, I'm, I'm going to not say so much about their numerical method. However, they've done a, um, they've done a, um, they've made a very special purpose numerical method, and there's, there's several parts to that. Uh, the first part is a, um, is, um, is a, 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 an adaptive mesh, and I'll show something about that. Uh, they, have an, they have a novel adaptive mesh method. Uh, what's, what's important for them is that the, uh, the, the meshing is all done analytically. That is, they write down a formula with some parameters in it, and they, uh, they evolve those parameters change in time, but there's formulas in that do the mapping of the, of the, uh, from the physical uh, variables to the mesh variables. That's one thing. They have a, um, a, uh, a six-order Galerkin method that they use for the, um, um, for the elliptic part of it and, and find that difference uh, that's that where they've done very careful studies of the, of the accuracy of that method. Um, and then they, in time, they do a, a, a fourth order run of, run of cut of method with an adaptively chosen time step. Um, here's a picture of their results. Let's see, let me try to, this is in the, Physical variables R and Z. This is, these are not the computational variables. The, here you see their mesh, though. And I've done this at a time, 0.003. The singularity time is at about, the singularity time is, um, if I remember it right, is 0 0.003055. Uh, Actually, maybe I've got the, I'm not sure about that O. Um, so this is a little bit before the singularity. It, this is the this is the last. They have other they have plots later on. This is the last one where you ac actually can see anything in the physical variables, uh, because here you do see it, it lifting up and forming a and getting large. It's 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 uh, it's been ma it's been amplified from the initial data, which had uh, about size uh, hundred. It's it's um, it's uh, been amplified some. It's up to ten to the fourth. Um, and um, here you see the singularity is at r equal one, and z equals zero. Like I said, so it, it's down in, there on the cylinder. This, of course, is just a plot of the r z plane because that's all you need to know. A, you know, a, a planar cut through the through the cylinder. Um, here it is in the. This is a little bit time time a little bit later, a little bit before the singularity, and I, and I did remember the singularity time right. Um, the, uh, this shows interesting behavior in the, this is not the physical variables. These are the, um, the logical vari whoops. These are the logical, damn it. These are, I guess you could, these are the mesh variables, rho and eta. So rho is a, is a mapping of r, eta is a mapping of z. Uh, here, this is a little bit, time a little bit later, so it's grown from, in the last, at, at the point 003, it was size 10 to the, um, fourth, I think, and now it's size 10 to the 11th, and, um, and what you see is this peak. This is, there is a, there is a slow variation of the, of the, of the variables. This is, um, it's a plot of the absolute value of the vorticity, so there's a slow variation of vorticity over the physical variables, and what you're seeing is a, this ramp here is just a result of the meshing, so that you see that slow variation looks like faster variation as you're changing the mesh, and then it then it uh, af then it slowly ramps up to this to then to this peak. 
So that, that isn't something physical. That's just the, that indicates the mesh variables. Their mesh is a um, their mesh also is a product uh, mesh. That is, it's um, it's one set of variables in R and another set of variables in Z. So that's why there's a that's why there's that corner there as well. So this doesn't mean much physically. This is really just from the numerical method, um, right? Here is the uh, maximum vorticity, and so. Um, the maximum vorticity and the initial data is 10 to the 3. So in that picture that we showed at 0.003, it had been, I think it was amplified only by a factor of 10. Uh, oh, and this is on meshes of various different sizes. Um, not being a numerical person, you know, really, this, it's, it's, is it impressive to go from 10 to the 24 to, to 2048? Well, you, they've doubled the number of mesh points. But because of the mesh refinement, uh, they, the, uh, the resolution in the is is concentrating on the the, um, the singular region, so they're getting a lot of resolution in the near the singularity, and they the computation is uh, accurate up until this time, where the values are uh, have grown by um, um, four uh, roughly four times ten to the eighth in size, so they got tremendous amplification of the vorticity in this. Um, here they did a resolution study of this. This is in the relative error of omega, so it's the soup of the error in omega divided by the size of the vorticity. So it's it is, you know it's being scaled out as they, you, they you've got to talk about relative error in this, and they are getting um, a relative error of size about ten to the fourth. These are at various different grid sizes, and you see that uh, as they refine the grid, the accuracy is getting better. So they still are, by, by these indications, they still are quite accurate. They have four, four digits of accuracy, it would seem, up to, this, you know, up to the time that the 3.504, I guess it is, so the vorticity has increased by a factor of 10 to the 11th, 10, 10, to, the, 10 to the 8th, excuse me, 10 to the 8th uh, in this time, and they are keeping four digits of accuracy over that whole time. This is... This is um, Relative error, the next plot is order, order of accuracy. And you can see that they, um, they, they actually can show, they actually are able to tell you what the errors are from, but they roughly are staying fourth order accurate. You, you, don't, you don't get fourth order accuracy uh, in early times because the error is due to round off. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not due to numerical error. Um, so uh, when, when it's due to numerical error, then, then you see four, four, uh, fourth order accuracy um, up to the, almost up to the singularity time. Sixth order, a little bit away from the singularity, fourth order close to it. So the, they haven't lost order accuracy, or not too much at least, near the singularity. Um, they have done a, uh, a fit. So the first thing you would ask is, is how, what's, what's the, um, you know, after you get this amplification, you can ask how fast is it growing? So we would like to see, and what they find is that um, they have two different methods for computing this. Let's see, so what I'm looking for is the, it doesn't exactly say it here, does it? What I'm looking for is the, um, they're looking for the, you know, soup in X of the vorticity. This is, um, is um, they, they're looking for this to be something like, T, the singularity time minus T to a power uh, they called gamma. And the question is, what does gamma look like? And it's, it must be minus gamma. And they find that, um, they find by two different methods of fitting to find gamma, they find this, this, the exponent is about 2.5. Um, they believe that these numbers are meaningful and that it's not 2.5, that it's 2.45 something. And um, that's a, uh, I think from the analysis viewpoint, that's a big difference. If it's 2.5, that's a nice number, you know, and, and we can think of that it has something to do with, um, we can think that it's somehow generic, you know, that, that like square root singularities are generic in a certain sense. If you take a, if you take a, a complex singularity and you perturb it a little bit, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll become square roots. And, um, and, you know, the reason you don't get a square root when a shock forms, you get a cube root, is because it's two singularities that hit. 
it's a it's a a, a fold in the you know in in the um, in the singularity theory. So that that actually is generic as well. Is that you get a cube root when that happens. So um, if this is 2.5, then you can think that um, that it might have something to do with singularity theory and 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 complex singularities. If it's 2.45. Um, then I think it's much harder to understand it. Um, so uh, I choose to say that it's 2.5. <laughs> but and they won't they won't say they you know they they can't ex they can't uh, they will say they'll say okay sure you know they they think that it's not but they don't have you know their evidence isn't ir irrefutable and the computations are hard enough. That if you say, well, just go do it on a couple more, go go do this thing a few more times, and see if you get the same exponent, or see, or change your a couple parameters in your numerical method, you know that's like that's months or or uh, or more of work. So it's not so easy for them to go check it, you know, in in some way. So, um, right. Um, actually, the, their singularity time is slightly different than what I said. I think the last time that the, the time they ended was it was about here. But this is what they, right? Um, okay. Then, then they compared it to other. <laughs> this is so. This is an amusing slide because it compares this, their results to the results of some other calculations. And for example, in these other calculations, you get vorticity amplification by a factor of, um, you know, of 20 to 200, and theirs is by a factor of 10 to the eighth. So uh, this one is so. Um, also, I think they've done a much more careful. You know, of course, they have bigger computers. It's not that they're supermen or something. They have bigger computers, but they've also put an, a tremendous amount of time into doing the calculations carefully. And they've compared. You know, they've done lots of, of error checks. They've co compared to all the um, all the um, known seniority results. You know, the, the PDE results that I said that were necessary conditions. They've shown that all those are satisfied. That is, every, you know, with their for what they're looking for, everything blows up in the right, in the right kind of way for the Biocato Mida and the the uh, Constantine Pfefferman Mida and the um, the um, Tom Howell's extension of it. So they, so I, I think this is as convincing. This is orders of magnitude more convincing than anything we've seen before. Now here's now here's where I think it starts to get interesting from an analytic viewpoint is that uh, they have a. They have a uh, similarity solution that is near in the neighborhood of the singularity. They can match their solution to a similarity form. Uh, there is a um, there's a continuous um, family of there, there's a there's a family of similarity solutions for the those for those for the axisymmetric flow with swirl that looks like this. And the uh, let's see, do I have it? Do I have the yes? So uh, there are so there's four parameters here in this similarity solution. Uh, there are, there is the, um, we take L of T as a power of, uh, everything is TS, a power of the, the, the time to singularity, TS minus T. So there's a parameter gamma L in here, and then there's powers gamma in, on, the, on the three uh, components of the, of the, the um, flow field. So, and those parameters, Boil down to a single to a single parameter, the gamma L, the uh, which is the the uh, the length scale as a function of as a function of time. So it, the length scale is t to the gamma L. So there's there's a, this is a one parameter family of solutions. So there um, um, this is consistent with their um, their uh, their time exponent. The, the time exponent they found was um, um, I believe it's this one. Gamma omega. So their uh, uh, their gamma omega could be two point could be uh, minus two point five, two point four five, because there th because this is not a the uh, the similarity solution does not pick out a unique set of values. It's a continuous set of values. So it doesn't have to be a, a fraction or an integer or something. So they match to but anyway. So they match to the um, they they they. Take their solution and match it to this kind of similarity form, and they find the following. They find these following scaling exponents, and I didn't say it quite right. It wasn't gamma omega, um, but uh, anyway, it's some other combination. 
Uh, and so the, um, the most important one maybe is this gamma L. It determines the others. And um, I would claim it's three. Um, and, and if it's three, then the other one is 2.5. So the deviation of this from three is related to the deviation of the, of the, the other exponent, the, the time exponent there. Let's see, so they found, they found this gamma was, like I said, was, um, was about uh, 2.45. Um, and then there's this gamma L, which they find to be about 2.9, which, so these two are consistent and these two would be consistent. Right. Yes? Fixed. The, the singularity doesn't move in time. No, it's on the boundary. It's just from, it's, well, it's from a quarter plane, right? It's, it's a quarter plane. Yeah. Right. Yes? Yes. Uh, the points on the boundary, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so their mesh, their mesh looks like, um, let's see, I, I'm not sure if I, that I'll say it exactly right, but their mesh looks like this. It's a, it's a function, Z is a function of, um, it's a function of that, um, a variable, the eta, and R is a function of the variable they called rho. Uh, I think I got the names right. And so it's a, um, it's a, um, it's a tensor product. So, so they do an, an even, they, so they, they do, um, they do uniform meshes in rho and, and, and these are functions of time as well. They do uniform meshes in eta and rho, and so they get a, a, a mesh that looks like a, it looks like a product in, in, in Z and in Ada, um, what I wanted to try to draw was, can you see it still? Okay, so they, so their mesh is, you know, is, is, looks something like this. It's a, it's a, it's a tensor product in that sense. So yes, it is along the wall. If this was the wall, it would, there would still be an adaptive mesh along the wall. I'm sorry, I didn't do a very good job, but, but this would be the point uh, zero, one, where the singularity is. Did that answer your question? Okay. So they, they have these, uh, these, so they have these exponents that they found. Uh, they found that by matching each component, and um, they, there's, and so uh, they are, you know, they're found independently, but they do match the previous requirement for the similarity solution, um, right? So that's a lot of information we have. You know, there's a, there is a, uh, it's still, the, the similarity solution satisfies a, 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 a PDE in two variables, because it's, it's in R and Z. Time, time is, is factored out of it, but the similarity form, but it's still in R and Z. Uh, let's see, I guess I'm ending a little early, but uh, here are the conclusions. Um, the, um, well, the first one is that, is that uh, one reason for studying this is, besides it being a, a mathematical challenge, one reason to study it is that, uh, that, it, that inviscid singularities may play a role in viscous turbulence. Um, I, if you took a vote among fluid dynamicists, I'm not sure if anyone, I think they would say what? Uh, I think this was a popular idea some years ago. I don't think it holds a lot of credence now, but I think it's, but it's more that they're just not talking about it in those terms. 20 years ago, that's, people were talking about it, that a lot, and the problem wasn't solved and people move on. So I think the jury's kind of out about that. Um, I believe that complex singular solutions is, a, is a, a good way to try to construct these solutions, but the real advance in the field is this computations of low and how, and I've kind of tried to summarize it here. The singularity is, at, is, is stuck. It doesn't move in time. It's stuck on, a, on the corner of a, of a boundary of a, of a, a, a cylinder of, uh, um, that I, as, as I've drawn it there. It's right at, it's, that, that of course means that the, similar, that the, the singularity is in, a, is in a ring. In 3D, it's in a ring. They get amplification by a factor of 10 to the eighth. They get a, 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 
they get a time dependence that looks like this for the, for the vorticity, minus two and a half. They've retained accuracy and resolution. Here's something I didn't say. They find the vorticity is parallel to the second um, uh, direction, uh, eigenmode of the uh, strain matrix, which is not completely unexpected, but is some important information. Um, and near the singularity, they find that the solution has a similarity form, which I've tried to write here, where uh, I put in what I think is three, but they find about 2.9, and it's in its similarity variables in R and Z um, with scaling and scaled in time. Thank you very much.